Hello everyone and welcome to the Intimate Talk series Amati Efforts and today we have a fantastic episode for you because our guest speaker today is Stephanie Benedetto, a founder of Queen of Rock. You know, we we've been growing globally. Um, as you know, we have team on the ground now in Europe, Asia, non for profit in Africa. So we will continue to do that and of course to service and support the textile industry and fashion. But the beauty of where we're going is to us fashion is just the beginning. Hi, Stephanie. It's so nice to have you with us today. Thank you. So happy to be together. Always a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Well, I for those viewers who doesn't know you, I want to read some of your accolades, if if I may. Stephanie Benedetto was uh, rewarded by MIT Solve, Circle Economy Solver, NASA, Nike, IKEA, Dell, Innovator, Thread Up Circular Fashion Fund recipient, partnered with New York Circular City Initiative, MIT Seoul, United Nations, World Economic Forum, European Union, UK Parliament, US Department of State, and as seen in Good Morning America, New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Entrepreneur, WWD, Forbes L, Business of Fashion, and Vogue Business. How did you do it? <laughs> well, you are too kind, but you know what? Like everything, it takes all of us together to make all of these things possible. So we don't do these things alone, but appreciate all the kind words and support. You built a global company in a few years. Can you take us back to how it all started, please? Absolutely. Well, if I'm really going to take it back to how it all started, it goes back a hundred years <laughs> because my great grandfather uh, came over on a ship from Austria. He landed at Ellis Island and he settled into the Lower East Side of New York, which at the time was the original Jewish garment district. And as an immigrant chasing the American dream, he had to make a living for his family. And so he would find all these materials nearby to him old fabrics and furs and things immigrants brought over on the ships, but they weren't using anymore. And he would repurpose them by hand into beautiful fashion garments. And he sold it to local customers. And it was a very profitable, successful business. Many of his coats and stoles and bolero jackets I still wear 100 years later. And what's funny about it, I did grow up around him. He lived to a beautiful age of 105 and I'd hear the stories of the old school ways of doing business. And it truly was an inspiration to me. You find resources nearby, you sell to local customers, you make things with minimal waste, but he didn't talk about it as sustainability. But at the end of the day, that's very much what it was. And so a lot of our inspiration in Queen of Raw came from that journey and that history. How can we use technology to get back to the way my great grandfather did business, um, even with such an expansive now global supply chains around the world. And that's really been kind of our North Star and what guides us a lot in our business. I didn't do the family route right away. Um, I did end up as Wall Street as, as a corporate attorney, but I was specializing in fashion, technology, sustainability. So I guess at the end of the day, back to your roots and who you are, right? We can't deny this. Mm -hmm. And then um, went out on my own, always wanted to build a business and, and go change the world. So that that's what brought, brought us to Queen of Raw and, and we've been building ever since. Oh, that's a fantastic story. I, I just, I love to hear that because I'm also an immigrant in the first generation. So all these almost like Cinderella stories are very close to my heart. <laughs> You're right. And, oh, it's um, beautiful. And, they, you know, our generations are very fortunate in, in the world that they grew up in. But at the same time, to have that history, it's, it is important to remember where we came from and who we are and obviously go change where we're going. Absolutely. Always. Um, so it was quite a pivot, you know, from you being an attorney and starting your own company. I know a lot of, especially after COVID, a lot of young entrepreneurs are stepping on the same um, uh, route in, in their careers, they're leaving their workplaces, they're starting uh, their businesses. How did you manage to do that? Where did you find funds? Yeah, it, It's a great question because obviously we can all have wonderful ideas, but where do you go and what do you do on day one? 
And the first thing that we did as a company is, and, and you'll hear this if you Google this, it, it's a very familiar scenario. We had a hustler, a hacker, and a hipster in the company. I, <laughs> I, was, the hipster. I was the one who went out, had to network, build partnerships, build deals, find customers. We had a hipster. the hustler? I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we had a hipster who was the incredible creative genius who gave us the original branding behind Queen of Rock, who we are, what we stood for, the photography, the imagery worked with us on the voice. And then we had the hacker who is still our CTO and co-founder who obviously implemented the technology based solution to deliver the results that we were going after. So coming together with the three of us, the first thing we do was got a website up. We didn't even have a product to sell or a line of code built, but we got a website up to start talking about who we are, what we're doing and what our voice is. And I find a lot of times entrepreneurs don't do that. We're so scared to get our idea out there or it's not perfect yet, or someone's going to try to take it that we get very closed. And the best thing we did was start to get out there because you talk to customers, you learn from what their pain points are, what they're looking to solve, what they're interested in, what they need and want. And that very much informs the product and where we've grown today. Um, so I highly recommend that. The other thing we did early on that really helped, don't go spend a penny in PR marketing or advertising, at least not right away. While you're figuring out this voice, um, you know, there are a lot of ways to get uh, to get on platforms and incredible platforms and speak and podcasts and whatnot about who you are and what you're doing and get out there. And then the final thing we did was there are a million of amazing competitions out there for, you know, for sustainability, women in tech, right? All of these groups, you mentioned a bunch of them in the beautiful introduction. We applied to every competition out there and, you know, you never know what you're going to win, but it can't hurt to try. So don't tell yourself before you get out the gate, not to go apply, apply to all of them. We were so delighted and surprised by some of them that, that we got to win. One of the biggest ones we did was the WeWork Creator Awards. We had an opportunity to pitch Ashton Kutcher, P. Diddy, and Gary V live on stage in front of a huge studio audience. The trick was we had 60 seconds to convince them everything about our business and get them to invest. Fortunately, we had an amazing 60 second moment and yes, and, and that was a great way to get some early, you know, pre-seed funding and kick off the ground running. So just a few little things we did that I found really helpful and valuable. Funny enough, a lot of that 60 second pitch I still use today, right? Years later. So it can also be a North star guiding light for you when you can get it down in 60 seconds. <laughs> exactly. No, sometimes actually all the times it's all we have. Yeah, no, we, we started ours with, are you naked right now? <laughs> because you're using fabric. It's everywhere, but it's polluting your water. And then we went on from there. So you got to grab the attention and have a little fun too. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so you, um, as a company, you turn pollution into profit. So you work a lot with textile mills, with the whole like textile industry. What bothers you the most in how textiles are produced and used today? You know, if any good can come out of what's going on in the world with pandemics and wars and trade wars and recession, it's that people have woken up to how much people and planet matter. And in some ways, I don't know if we would have had the kind of global growth and enterprise adoption that our company has had, if not for some of these things happening. So it wasn't eye-opening for the world. Before that, I spent a lot of time out there talking about the issues of the textile waste and textile industry on our people and our planet because people didn't know about it. Um, and it's funny because we spend a lot of time learning about the food that we put in our body and the ingredients. But what about the materials that touch our skin and our children's skin and our loved one's skin all day and all night? Um, what about what's in that touching your, or your, your largest organ of your body? So, um, you know, a lot of people didn't know. And when you look at the numbers, they're so big, it can almost be overwhelming. The textile industry is by some accounts, the number two polluter in the world of clean water globally. And it sits behind oil and agriculture, which of course it also uses. So it contributes to the number one polluter. And I'll give you one statistic that really resonated with me. According to the World Wildlife Fund, if we continue at the current pace of textile production, by 2025, 
two thirds of the entire world's population will face shortages of fresh water and be exposed to hazardous chemicals from textile production alone. And I mentioned that because we're not talking about 100 years from now. We're not talking about 50 years from now. We're talking about today and on our shores. And I think that sense of urgency is really what matters to me. I am a mother to two incredible children, Jacob and Jeremy, and I want them to have clothes that aren't toxic to wear, clean water to drink, a planet to live on. And the beauty of it is by saying textiles and fashion is the number two polluter in the world of clean water, it also means that textiles and fashion have the power to solve the world's water crisis if we rethink how we do things. And that's been our frame of mind. Absolutely. Um, so you, uh, I love the way you kind of um, strategize about inviting companies like fashion companies and other companies that use textile into your space. Uh, can you please uh, explain how companies can leverage their budget? Yes. and to continue their circular level, uh, circular efforts. There's been this assumption when you hear circularity, sustainability, that it's automatically going to cost you a lot more money to participate. And the challenge is, especially in times of pandemic and economic disruption, how are you going to get people to spend a ton more for something? It has to make business sense. And so we've always taken the view that circular economy is about the circle, people and planet, but it's also about the economy. If the solution we're providing is not an economic principle and doesn't make business sense and doesn't help drive the bottom and top line of a company's revenue, then why are they going to adopt that solution? And so the way we have thought about enabling and empowering everyone to participate, we work with everyone from a student, maker, crafter, quilter, to the biggest Fortune 500 companies in the world. And the way we're able to engage them and get them to participate is by giving them a platform where if you have excess inventory, dead stock, unused fabrics, unused finished goods, we give you a platform to centralize all the information about it and take action on it. Reuse it, resell it, recycle it, or donate it. Obviously doing that, you save and make money while also being part of the circular economy. And on the flip side, they're not just people wanting to sell this, but what about those who are looking for access to these materials and resources? If you're a student maker crafter and you just want a couple of yards of a sustainable fabric available right near your studio where you live, right? Have available these resources um, at a discount. How great is that? And for the biggest companies in the world too, amplify that. How much money and time and resources could be saved if they didn't have to go from store to store and place to place trying to find materials. It was readily available at their fingertips, digitally, locally, um, and at a good price point. And that's really what our platform is about uh, and, and empowering everyone to be able to participate, but in a way that makes business sense. I actually, um, I, I'm one of your clients um, and I remember helping during pandemic, I remember helping a company to sell their um, uh, old stock, old textiles, and I absolutely like heads off to you because pandemic was such a difficult logistical time and warehouses were closed and post offices were not working and you just showed the amazing grace and <laughs> patience with, and I felt uh, that there is no uh, customer that is too small or too big for you. You just attend to everyone with the same um, generosity and <laughs> attention. That is so kind of you and means a lot to us. Uh, you know, it's funny because obviously we're we're out there and we talk about the good work we're doing. And if you Google us, of course, we are aligned and doing a lot of work with everyone from fast fashion to luxury haute couture. But I can tell you that that's a big part of the problem and also the solution. But that also means we need to engage everyone. It can't just be about them to truly solve this problem. And so at any volume size, at any size company or individual, en masse, that stuff adds up and we can have a real impact from one yard, one t-shirt to tens of millions of yards and t-shirts at a time. So that is that is very important to us. 
Absolutely. Uh, speaking about t-shirts, I remember that statistic you mentioned that it takes 700 gallons of water to produce one cotton t-shirt, correct? Yes, that is the average, absolutely. And on top of that, another 700 gallons of water to wash that one t-shirt in its lifetime. That for one shirt alone is enough clean water for two people to drink around the world for three years. Absolutely. And it's wow. fascinating because over 2 billion shirts sold around the world every year. So it, it, it at least that may be an old statistic now. Um, do you have any stories, like interesting stories? I'm sure you have plenty but <laughs> about how your company progressed and uh, how it developed. Uh, so if you can share with the, with the viewers would be amazing. Absolutely. So, you know, obviously, as I mentioned, we want everyone to be able to participate and we do work from one yard, one t-shirt at a time and up. But it is nice to be able to see that not only does the individual or a student maker, crafter and quilter care and participate, but that we can actually also get the biggest companies in the world to participate. And that's important because in order to really have an impact, it has to be automated, our solution has to be scalable, and we need to demonstrate that we can do this with the biggest companies in the world. So, um, you know, we were very proud to launch our platform with Nike as one of our marquee enterprise customers. Um, and then to have had even just last year, two amazing case studies that I mentioned, because I'm so proud of the work that the team has done and what we've been able to do with Ralph Lauren to show what we've done with, uh, with Haute Couture and obviously a luxury fashion. We started in just a handful of locations in China and Vietnam and leveraging our platform, they were able to take action on 12.8 metric tons of excess inventory to start. And the beauty of it is they actually diverted 92% of that from landfill and incineration. Wow. It was such a great result. Yes, it was in there audited by their auditors in their ESG report and their CEO mentioned it as point number two in his cover letter. So I'm really proud of that being able to show in luxury, here's what's possible, how much value can be derived from these beautiful materials, the longer we can keep them in circulation through reuse, resale, recycling, and donation. And then we can do it. We can get to in the 90s percent diversion. If not, I'd love to be at 100%. We're not, nobody is perfect and we're not there yet for every material category, but getting there. Um, one other case study that I think is interesting to talk about is obviously on the other end, and that's fast fashion. And I am very transparent and our company believes that, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, we need to invite everyone to be able to participate in order to solve a problem. And so we are proud to work with fast fashion. We built a company to solve a problem and we believe everyone should be able to be a part of that. So we do work with fast fashion and, and a lot of people, when they understood what we were building and doing, they said, well, I get why companies are gonna wanna sell this, but who's gonna wanna buy this stuff, right? Is, is, what company is gonna buy from another company? And the beauty of what we've been able to unlock in this market is that the biggest companies in the world are not just selling, they're also turning around and buying. And Shein is one such example. Um, because of the unique business model that they operate in, it is very on-demand, small lot production, just-in-time, real-time, locally made. They can leverage readily available excess inventory, put it into their designs and creations, and make something that still fits their um, their customer and their customer's price point, but it was made out of resources that were already there instead of having to go out and create new. And so they've gone so far now as we're growing with them and doing more with them to have pledged to be a world leader in procuring excess inventory across our exchange, starting with a million units. So that just shows there isn't just supply out there, there is real demand and real big, even fast fashion companies willing to put a stake into the ground as to where they're going and what they're doing to have a measurable impact and to measure and report their progress. So I'm very excited to continue to, to work with co all companies around the world to deliver real results. Oh, that's amazing. Oh my God, I'm, I'm so glad you're working with the biggest companies because that's exactly, it's shakers and movers and uh, that, that's where the problem will be solved. We believe so, so as well, appreciate it. Um, so on the more personal level, um, 
how do you perceive failure and what success in your opinion looks like? I love that question. Uh, and that, that's a very good one. Failure is, it's an interesting topic because I believe a hundred percent that we all make mistakes every single day. And I can give you tons of stories about mistakes we've made. Most important is that we got valuable learnings out of them and we picked ourselves back up and kept going. And I've always said when you're building a business, um, you're going to look around you as an entrepreneur and see people who may be beating you in the sprint. Maybe they raised more money. Maybe they made more money. Maybe they got bigger customers or so it seems and what you've learned. But being an entrepreneur and building what I believe is a long lasting successful company that is truly solving a problem and building for people, planet and profit, that kind of a company you want to win the marathon not just the sprint. And so it is about that endurance. It is about learning from mistakes you make, getting back up and being the last person in your market to really still be standing and dominating. And so that's kind of the mindset that we go into, always be learning, always be improving, always be growing and innovating and, and learn from any mistakes or failures, right? And don't let that get yourself down. If I had listened to the nose. And the first day of starting this company, we wouldn't, none of us would have been here today because of how many people said, nah, shut a door, you know, no, I'm not interested or, oh, that's really nice what you're doing. That, that's a nice to have. Well, we kept going, we kept going and we found the early adopters who really understood what we were doing and why this made business sense. And fortunately, you know, years later, this has become the hottest topic in the world. And a lot of those no's have turned to yeses, but it doesn't happen overnight. So just keep going and don't be afraid. Keep pushing. Oh, that's a fantastic advice. Uh, you know, um, because I think failure has such an emotional attachment to it. We get very emotionally, I don't know, bruised, I guess. So yeah, I, I, it's a fantastic advice to just- Not a failure, <laughs> that's the learning and you keep going. You find a way and you keep going. And I think that's a lot of people on a personal level, we all felt that going through pandemic and now recession, right? And we want to inspire each other to get through it all. Absolutely. And come well, out better on the other side. Yes. Yes, together. <laughs> um, so once I was leaving the Text World show in Javits Center in New York, it was January, very slippery. And um, I turned around and I see you running. <laughs> you were, I think you were maybe eight months pregnant running. Um, I I was trying to like kind of get close to you, but I had to like make small steps. And then you held the cap and you were gone, probably to another meeting. Huh. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, Stephanie Benedetto in the powerhouse. Oh. So how do you do it? That, I know you, you're running a global company. You're a mother of two. Um, you probably, you know, run a household. This is all we do. How do you do it? What is What your day looks like? I have to say that uh, for me, uh, having children was my inspiration and the greatest thing for me. I knew I wanted to be a working mom. I always knew I wanted children, but I always knew I wanted to work, that I loved working and, and, and wanted to build something. So for me, the two, it was never one or the other. It was always both and they were always possible, but most importantly, they fuel and support each other. Um, early on in building the company, having young children was actually an advantage because I knew one, I knew what I loved, what I cared about was my children. And so building something that could give them a planet to live on and solve a problem for them in the future was, was what drove me even more than ever before. Um, that experience of having children, right? It, suddenly it's not about you anymore. It's about your children and your children's children, what you can do for them. And so that has very much been in my heart and my soul, what drives me through those challenges to get down, pick myself back up because I want my children to see that and I want them to do the same. Um, but it also, as I mentioned, never was one or the other. And it's, in so many ways, it's been such a value add. I try to make the most of every moment when I have it. That's moments with my children and moments when I'm working. 
And then, of course, having children and being up at all hours, it's great for a global company. I could check in if I was up, you know, and breastfeeding one child. I could check in what's going on with our team in China, what's going on in this part of the world. So it actually was was a value add in, in all respects. So I do hope everyone feels like if it's for you and you want to do it, you absolutely can do it and you should do it. Um, there, I can say in terms of a personal story, Early on, when I had just my first child, Jacob, we were living in a New York City apartment and I was pushing him in the streets. And of course, it was very loud and noisy as New York City can be. And I heard something coming out of the stroller and he was three at the time. And I leaned forward and I literally hear this three year old saying, are you naked right now? You're not. because." And he was doing my pitch. Yes, and I have the video to prove it for anyone who doesn't believe it. I recorded it. I and it. it got me thinking in the one moment, okay, maybe I've pushed this stroller in New York City streets a few too many times while practicing that pitch. But at the same time, then I said, you know, if he can get it, anyone can get it. And that's why I do what we do and we can change the world. So that was a moment when they collided that meant a lot. That's amazing. So they are your biggest supporters, I'm pretty sure. Thank you. Well, as, as I <laughs> am. <them. laughs> Absolutely. So what's in the future for you and Queen of Raw? You know, we, we've we been growing globally. Um, as you noted, we have team on the ground now in Europe, Asia, non-for-profit in Africa. So we will continue to do that. And of course, to service and support the textile industry and fashion. But the beauty of where we're going is to us, fashion is just the beginning. Textiles touch everyone, everyone in the world every day. It's your clothing, but it's also the material on your chair, the inside of your car, the carpet under your feet. How do we integrate other industries into this even better? And so we've been growing now in CPG, automotive, aviation, um, and, and expanding in hospitality, tourism. So looking at other industries that can leverage this solution to truly, as we started the conversation, talking about build that circle. For the circular economy um so that's been very exciting to us where we're growing and uh it's and feel like we're just getting started absolutely um is your company powered by ai yes yeah. I mean, what, co but then I laugh because I'd say that what company isn't these days, at least if right. they're doing something right, but it is a very hot topic these days. What blockchain was for a while, which we do use as well, machine learning AI now, but we could talk more about the AI and why. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie, it's, I appreciate, I know how busy you are. I appreciate uh, this interview so much. I wish you and your family and your company an amazing, um, happy and healthy year and, and great, great success in all areas. Well, Everything thank you so much for all the kind words for taking this journey in time with me. Of course, talking about this matters. And just to close the loop on what you were saying about machine learning AI and why I think it's so important and is the future, we have these conversations that you and I just had and it's so powerful and there's a lot of storytelling and there was a lot of data we talked about, but being able to take that data and having machines, especially in complicated supply chains that are hundreds of steps across the globe, metric tons of water, chem chemicals, crops, oil used, to be able to have data be read intelligently and help companies understand what to do with the excess inventory in their supply chain. And most importantly, how to not have that excess in the future intelligently minimize it going forward. So that is how we use machine learning AI. But at the end of the day, there's nothing like sitting down and talking to someone like you. So thank you so much as well. Um, and proud to be here and excited to get back together with you soon. Oh, thank you. It's been a thank pleasure. You. My pleasure. Bye.